Hey, we're here to answer more of your questions on COVID. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Question one, some fabric masks have an exhalation valve. Doesn't that defeat the purpose? Well, yeah, if it's just a hole by which you're breathing out, sure. But I assume, and I hope, that most of those masks have something in line to still serve as some kind of filter, perhaps not as thick, but better made with a different quality material that stops virus, even as it makes it a little bit easier to breathe. Stan asked me about a plastic window. I have not seen any of those masks, but I assume that if it's part of the mask, then it's still nothing can get through solid. Your breath just goes around it, so it's probably fine. Two, are the antibody tests accurate enough to bother with yet? Okay, so like in some hospitals and where the labs are running them, sure. But a lot of those off the shelf ones or the ones that you get at CVS or, you know, I'm not blaming CVS, but that you could get almost anywhere. Some of those are a questionable quality and still given the low incidence in general, you may wind up getting some false positives. So I'm not rushing out yet to get an antibody test. Uh, I'm not really sure it's worth it outside of the research setting. What are your thoughts on going to the pool this summer? Of course, it depends on what the pool is like. If it's a pool in your friend's backyard and there's two of you in the pool and you're on opposite sides, by all means, go. Um, but if it's a crowded public pool where you're crammed in like sardines and it's impossible to social distance, I don't know if I would do that. So again, you wanna just think about the same kind of social distancing that you would want to do in general. You don't wanna be on top of each other. If you have to, it's probably better to wear a mask. I know that's hard in the pool, but you know, in general, being outside is better than being inside, but you don't wanna to get too close to people. Four, how concerned should we be about a second wave? Well, first of all, you're assuming that the first wave finished, and that's not entirely clear in some places. Now, granted, some states have seen a real wave and then coming down. Other states, though, sort of never really hit a wave and are now jumping up. That's like they're seeing their first wave, and some saw a peak and then never really came down and are continuing going up. That's not the same thing. So the problem is we're describing the United States often as one thing, and it looks like we came down, had leveled off and are going up again. But when you look at the states individually, they all have very different curves. Not all of them are what could be considered a second wave. Regardless though, things are getting bad in large parts of the country. That's concerning no matter what you call it. Five, if someone in my household is high risk, do we basically need to isolate as much as possible until there's a vaccine? Well, look, at the moment, I'd say still, you want to you wanna isolate as much as you can. That's always good um, for everybody. You know, reducing discretionary activities that put you at risk is a good idea, period. You know, until we get to a point where we reach herd immunity one way or another. But there are things that could happen in the meantime that could still make things better. Uh, there are treatments, some of them are antibody treatments. They're gonna be expensive to begin with, but maybe the cost will come down. They can not only treat people, even before they get super severely at risk, but might even do some prevention. Uh, the problem is right now they're very, very expensive. But, you know, better treatments might make it so that we could take a drug that might prevent people from getting sick. That would be a good thing. Another thing is if we ever got around to massive ubiquitous testing, then we could feel safer about many activities like going to work or going to the dentist or going wherever, uh, that would make people feel safer in general, you know, and going out and about. We just don't have the widespread testing still, and it's maddening, but those things, if we ever got to that point, or if we ever drove, drove this down to the ground and we actually made it pretty rare, which a lot of countries on the other side of the ocean have done, then we can all feel safer too. But given that the way things are in the United States right now, in large parts of the country, I still would be staying home if I was high risk let me put it this way. My parents, they're still really isolating. How useful is it for places to be checking temperatures when we know so many people are asymptomatic? Look, every little bit helps. We need to get to a risk minimization frame of thought. So we're not trying to do everything perfectly, but every little thing we do, including staying home when we're sick, washing our hands, social distancing, wearing a mask, and checking temperatures, every little bit helps. So we will potentially eliminate some people by checking temperatures safely, that, that's a good thing. Is it a cure-all? Is it gonna pick up the most people? No, um, it's one more thing that we can do. So we can ask people, do you, are, you, know, do you have a cough? Do you have a sneeze? Uh, have you lost your taste of smell? Uh, do you not feel well? Do you have vomiting or diarrhea? And we can check their temperature and all of those things help us pick up a decent number of people. But some people will still be totally asymptomatic which is why better testing and still doing all the good social distancing stuff is, is what we really need to do. Seven, 
I hear we'll have shortages of things like syringes even when we get a vaccine. Why can't we just make it oral like some other vaccines? Most of the oral vaccines are, have been live virus and you've, they've really gone away because we don't really like live virus vaccines. Um, and that's why more and more they're shots. Uh, so those need to be administered with syringes. But I'm not as worried about syringes, which are everywhere, you know, as you know, the other things that might happen. Like we need to manufacture billions of doses of a vaccine. We need to have that many little glass vials. We need to know how to transport them and store them and all that other stuff. That's also majorly concerning, would still need to happen even if it was an oral vaccine. But this is, I haven't heard of anyone working on a live virus vaccine. I can't see it happening. It's very, very, very unlikely that it could, or could or would be oral. Has anything useful, interesting, revealing come up in the latest research about why COVID has had such different effects in different people? Look, everything is a spectrum. Part of our problem with this is that we still are not accurately identifying all the people that have COVID. So we're only really sure about, for the most part, the people that get very sick. So then we start wondering about the people that don't. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, just like any seasonal flu, um, even, I should say seasonal virus, even let's talk about flu. So, you know, some people are fine. Some people get sick enough to go to the doctor. Some people get sick enough to go to the hospital. Some people die. Um, usually it's the people who are more at risk, who have the most severe symptoms. And that is what we are seeing with this strain of, of coronavirus. Uh, sometimes you get a flu, however, that seems to attack healthy people. I think the uh, flu pandemic of 1917-19, that was one of the huge problems. This one seems to affect mostly people with comorbid conditions and the elderly, and that's what happens. Now, why there's such a wide range of symptoms? You know, I think viruses often do that. We just don't focus on it so much because it's so rare that we see so many people infected so quickly and so at all at the same time. Um, and that's giving us a much wider perspective than we usually do. But, you know, it goes into the respiratory system. So you get those kind of effects. Then some people think it's into the blood vessels. That's why you see different effects. It clearly gets into cells or does other things as well. That's why you see other effects. But, you know, viruses, you have to also remember it's not just the virus, it's often the body's response to them through the immune system, and that can show up in a host of different ways. Nine, struggling to understand why increased cases aren't just a result of increased testing. Can you expand on the issue of overall positive rates? Okay, look, some increased cases would always be because of increased testing, but um, if we saw increased testing, for instance, and more and uh, you know, dropping positive rates, then we could feel better that we're testing more and more of the general population and then increases that we see might be due to the fact that we're doing just more increased testing. If, however, we see at the same time that as we're doing increased testing, more and more of the people we're testing are turning a positive, a higher percentage rate, that means that we're probably missing a lot more people with the virus um, because we're only testing the super sick. You know, we're testing the people that we're sure have it. That's when you get increasing positive rates. So increased testing and increased positive rates at the same time, you can't really feel comfortable that uh, that's just because we're doing more testing. But there are other ways to monitor this as well. That's where you could also look at doctor's visits. You can look at hospitalizations because hospitalizations clearly aren't due to just increased testing. And in many of the places we're worried about in the South right now, your Texas, your Florida, your Arizona, even your California right now, we're seeing not just increased numbers of cases, much larger than increased. We're seeing increased rates of positivity. We're seeing increased rates of hospitalization. And in some of those states, we're now finally seeing increased rates of death. Um, all of these things together, yeah, you can't th write that off then as just increased testing. If we were just seeing, you know, really low rates, you know, of positive positivity and massive increased testing and, you know, large numbers, but no otherwise things that are concerning, that would be a reasonable time to talk about whether we're just picking up more cases than we used to. But when everything's going wrong at the, wrong at the same time, it's very difficult to blame that just on increased testing. Ten. What are your thoughts on the growing consensus that extended periods of close contact are the primary form of COVID-19 transmission? Should we be less concerned about quick encounters or surface contamination? This is a phenomenal question and I wish that I had a great answer. So I would agree with this growing consensus. Um, you know, it appears that most of the cases in the United States come from a few types of locations, your nursing homes, 
your meat packing plants um, and bars and restaurants. You know, it's the places where people are close together for usually a decent period of time, unmasked, shouting, breathing, talking, eating, whatever it is. Um, and of course, nursing homes were, were a completely different thing. But given that, we need to be super careful about those kinds of activities. But they're not the only um, ones. They're, they're just the ones where it's clear that that's happened. Because, you know, when 15 people go to a bar together and all of them get sick, it's very easy to figure out where it was transmitted. When individuals are transmitting piecemeal, it's much harder. So those may be occurring. It's just harder to identify. But yes, the, the length of time you are together is one of the factors. Passing someone outside, you know, you know almost no chance of that you're going to transmit the virus. If, however, you know, you're walking together for a long time in a store, passing each other, probably still low, but it's getting higher. Sitting next to each other in a crowded bar while everyone is screaming and yelling to be heard while you're drinking and getting drunk and not being careful, yeah, real chance of transmitting the virus. Um, but even from the beginning, I think people were panicking a little too much about like, should I be concerned about getting the Amazon package? Yeah, there really wasn't much you know, evidence that if you pick up the package outside that you, know, you really have a solid chance of passing the virus. Now, there's a greater than zero, probably. Uh, but everything is about measuring your risk. And I would be most concerned about being indoors, really close to people for extended periods of time um, when you're doing things which make it more likely to be spewing virus outside. Uh, those are the things you worry about the most. That doesn't mean you don't worry at all about these other things. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this other episode we did on COVID surveillance and contact tracing. We'd also like it if you subscribe and like down below. And if you consider going on to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help keep the show going, even when there's a massive pandemic going on. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.